Amen. Did we say happy Mother's Day yet? All right. Here's a verse I want you guys to, to see right away. This is Jeremiah 6:16. 6, it says this. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Do you see the obstinance there right at the end? God's pleading with us and says, do you want to have rest for your souls? Not just a day at the spa, right? Do you want to have rest for your soul? You got to look for the good way. You got to look for the ancient paths and walk in those things. And will you? Some of you know I've been in Colorado on a sabbatical and, and it's been a wonderful time. And just to give you a little background on that, that and just open up to you a little bit about that because it's going to lead us into this morning's message a bit. I've been a full-time pastor now for going on 17 years. Um, I had a career, technology career before that and loved that career. I love this more. My, my uh, experience as a pastor has been adventure and purpose and people and seeing God move. And it's been the greatest, most thrilling, but also hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And sometimes the voices and the needs and the problems to solve Sometimes they uniquely have been a lot. And um, I've reached a space, I reached a space before where my emotional tanks were getting low, my spiritual tanks were getting low. Some of you have been there. And it's the kind of thing where you go on vacations and then you need a vacation from the vacation because the vacation didn't do what the vacation was supposed to do. Amen. And you, you reach a place of tiredness where... Um, it's just not easily restored. And, and so um, the elders and, and, and God called me to this space in Colorado just to go silent and to be quiet, to be alone with him. It was a me, God, and a Bible. The screens were off. The social media was off. I cleansed my phone of pretty much everything except for the, for the Maps app because I was afraid I was going to get lost in the mountains. And uh, so I kept that thing on there. But um, it was good. Here's the thing. You shut everything down. You shut all the tasks down. You shut all the problems down. All the stuff that you need to process, you can't process it all. You shut all that down, and it's good. You also shut down all the paths out in the back, all the affirmation, all the social, all the, you shut it all down. But you shut it all down and you lay yourself out there before God. And here's the thing. You find that God is there. You go into the silent place and you find that a holy, loving God, a father, shows up. And some of us don't even know it because we, we haven't made the space for him to do that. And... I just want to thank God publicly. He showed up and he spoke to me and he listened to me. He let me vent. I listened to him and, and he brought healing and he brought his word. Amen. So good. But in order to get there, I had to stop. Can you say stop? I had to stop. I had to stop everything in order to make space for him to do what he wanted to do and to show up. Henry J. M. Newen says it like this. He says, in solitude, we become aware that our worth is not the same as our usefulness. Mm, let that simmer. Your worth is not the same as your usefulness. There's something about solitude as a space where that truth starts to come alive. Because all those other things in your life that you were so busy about that were adding what you perceived to be your worth, what, they, what it really was, was usefulness. And there's something about standing before God alone and just being his child that all of a sudden we realize we have all the worth in the universe because God says we do. And that's enough. So I came back and 
all of a sudden it was like, we're going into Mother's Day and we, we, got a, we got a word for moms and I saw everything that God was doing in my own soul and so much of it was from a place of just kind of tiredness that wouldn't let go and I thought, wow, I bet there's a few moms around that have got some tiredness in them that won't let go. Can I get a better amen? <laughs> and so this message is, is for you, those of you that need rest and restoration. Now, I'll, I'll admit, there are maybe moms and parents amongst us and that maybe that's not the message they need. What, maybe what they need is a, a little bit of a kick in the pants from the scripture. And, and there are those messages and there's those passages of scripture out there like, hey, maybe, maybe step up a bit and maybe be a little more self-sacrificing and give some quality time and be not about yourself, but be about your kids and be about your family. And, and, and there are those, there are those uh, messages. Today is not that message. Today I'm speaking specifically to those of you who have poured yourself so deeply into your family and you have found it a difficult lift and you are in a space where you need the grace of God and you need to talk about stopping to care, not so much for your task list, but for your soul. So today I'm talking to the tired moms, running a little bit on empty. Anybody running on empty? You don't have to raise your hand. And also, not just the moms. Uh, I'm sure that there are others in here that were, were your leaders, your coaches, your teachers, your, your, your nurses, your doctors, your, your, your leaders amongst us. And you're also carrying such a load that you've been running a bit on empty as well if you were honest with yourself. And so this teaching today may be for you. So ears open, amen? amen. Ears open. Um, one final disclaimer before we get to the core text. This is a risky topic for a male pastor to talk about on Mother's Day to challenge moms. Um, I talked to Linda about this last night. She said, be careful. <laughs> so I'm going to be careful in the midst of this. Leviticus 25. Um, so we've been in this parable seri series, and I'm, I'm moving away from the parables, going to kind of break the rules just for today. Because this was a passage that God gave me as a core passage uh, during my sabbatical. And um, I believe it really applies to our need here today. Leviticus 25 verse 1. While Moses was on Mount Sinai, the Lord said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. And when you have entered the land that I'm giving you, the land itself must observe. The land itself, by the way, that's the dirt. Those are the fields. He's talking to farmers here. The dirt must observe a Sabbath rest before the Lord every seventh year. For six years, you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year, the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. Amen. It is the Lord's Sabbath, an entire year. Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that time. If you're a farmer, you get to work and you should work six years. By the way, God's pro work. God is pro-effort. He gave us work. Work is a gift from God. Six days of work don't, or six years of work, don't miss that part. But God is also for healthy rhythms of rest. On the seventh year, you rest the land. So next, and don't store away the crops that grow on their own or gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. The land must have a year of complete rest, but you may eat whatever the land produces on its own during its Sabbath. This applies to you, your male and female servants, your hired workers, and the temporary residents who live with you. Your livestock and the wild animals even in your land will also be allowed to eat what the land produces. So again, they're farmers, they're business people, they're, they're wealthy landowners. Like this is the income for the family. This is how we're going to get ahead and compete with all the other farmers. And you're telling me we don't get to plant every seven years. We have to take a complete year off. This would have required great faith. Some would have obeyed this. Some might not have obeyed this. 
But for those that did, what did God actually do? So, so exercise, don't, don't move on. Exercise your imagination for just a minute on how this would have been an experience for them to go through, to not plant their fields, to not prune, to not, to not weed, to not fertilize, to not do anything to their land for a year. And God says, and you don't get to harvest it. You don't get to take everything out and store it all, and go sell it on the market. You don't get to do any of that stuff. Instead, you've just got to leave it on the vine. And as your hungry family, you can go out and you can get yourself some grapes. As you need it for dinner that night, you go out and get yourself some fruit. Absolutely. But you don't get to take it all and possess it and control it. You don't get to. You've got to stop. Say stop. Stop. You have to stop is what God is saying. He is such a weird God, yes? (laughs) Who in your life is telling you to stop? God is telling you to stop. He tells them to stop. He tells them to leave it go. And and a lot of things come in like, what is God doing here? Like, Like exercise your holy imagination for just a minute. And I'm gonna say the word maybe a lot right now because we don't know exactly all the things that God was doing, but I've got some guesses. Can I give you some guesses? Here's some guesses. Like you imagine they don't cultivate that field. The seventh year, all the crops do come back naturally on their own to some degree. And as they do, they're going to let everybody get in there and eat, not just the landowners. And they're even going to let immigrants get in there. They're going to let the poor get in there. They're going to let their employees get in there. And everybody gets to eat off of their vines. What did that do for that culture the sense of goodwill and love and care between the different people groups. Was God doing something? Was he sowing something into that culture and into that people? Who knows? Maybe. And then God says, you got to even let your livestock get in there and eat. You've even got to get, let your, let the wild animals get in there and eat. And by the way, a lot of that stuff would have just rotted on the vine. Yes. And it would just fall into the ground. Now, when that stuff fell to the ground, what would have happened? As it rotted, wouldn't the nutrients have gone down and fertilized the soil for the very next year? Is it possible that God was sowing nutrients back into the soil at an ancient time when they didn't understand modern principles of crop rotation the way that we understand them now? Maybe God knew some things. Maybe God was doing some things. Even when the animals came in to feast on that fruit that was left behind, The animals, I'm guessing, would have left behind their own natural deposits, (laughs) little organic gifts, if you will, all around the field. We have a dog now. Whenever she eats, it always stirs some things. Amen? Right. (laughs) TMI, but thank you so much for sharing. Um, was God bringing in principles of, of healthy soil management and crop rotation in ancient time before any of that stuff was understood? Maybe. Was God building something into society? Maybe. What about the family itself that was sitting there for that seventh year? <sighs> they were so used to We harvest, we sell, this is our income, this is our budget, this is how we control things. We get in there and we're going to do these certain things to the field in order to ensure that in the future it's all going to happen this way. And God took all of that control, all that planning, all that stuff away from them for once every seven years. What additional time did it give that family just to chill out? What did it do to that family to say, you know what? Ultimately, we're not the ones that create income for ourselves. God does. We're not the ones who are actually in control. He's in control. What, what would it have been for that family who owned that land to walk into the fields and start picking grapes next to poor people? And they're, they're equal, side by side, just getting dinner. Wow, what did that do to them? And to trust God that the field would come back the next year even stronger, they had 
to trust. God called them to stop. Historians tell us that at the time of Alexander the Great's occupation of Israel and Julius Caesar's occupation of Israel, both of those emperors did not tax Israel during the seventh year. That's historical fact. Didn't tax them because there were no prophets to tax. Because people were walking this out. God called them to stop. Because in the stopping is the trusting, and in the trusting is the healing. In my sabbatical, God called me to stop. Because in the stopping is the trusting, and in the trusting is the healing of a soul. God has called you to stop, moms, maybe. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's this little list of things in there called the Ten Commandments. They were kind of etched in stone by Moses himself, you know. No big deal, up on a fiery mountain, finger of God stuff, you know, Ten Commandments. And in that list of Ten Commandments are things like do not murder, do not commit adultery, and also keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. If you've been in church before, you know that the Sabbath is you're going to work for six days because God's pro-work. He's pro-effort. But on the seventh day, he shows that he's also pro-rhythm of life. And he says, take that seventh day off. And it's on the same list as do not murder. Did I mention that before? Is do not murder. And yet we as Christians today, we tend to take the Sabbath day as an optional command. Why do we do that? Why, why don't we rest? And the voice of our culture is just so, so strong. And, and for those of us with a lot of needs around us and a lot of things that we're carrying, it becomes even harder to take that day off. But God calls us to a Sabbath day. It, 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 it always seems inevitable that it's on a Sunday that I get a hankering for tasty chicken. <laughs> and I lose brain power and I drive to the Chick-fil-A parking lot <laughs> and I see the sign and I knew what the sign was going to say, but I drove there anyway. I don't know how many times this has happened to me. Someone should question my intelligence because I've done it a lot. It's closed on Sundays. And I get angry. I don't like it. And I'm a pastor. I shouldn't get angry. It's Sunday. But don't you love what they're doing? I mean, you don't, but you should. (laughs) I mean, they're taking the healthy rhythm that God intended for humanity and they're bringing it to their employee family. And they're saying, we care more about your soul than we care about the bottom line. Whoa! And not only are they caring and loving, but what are they doing faith-wise? Because the rest of the world isn't taking Sunday off. I mean, well, (laughs) I'm just saying all the other fast food restaurants, man, they're, they're moving. You had to know that there have been moments where people have gotten around a table and they have discussed this again. There's a faith in God step that's going on. How much faith in God does it take to stop? As a mom, as a leader, how much time does it, how much faith in God does it take to stop? Is it as long as your task list still is? How overwhelmed do you feel? the burden and the load that is on you and how jammed the schedule is and and, and do you make a decision each week based on or do you trust? It's hard to trust because God's pro-work, but he calls us to stop because in the stopping is the trusting and the trusting is the healing. You got to stop. I mentioned at the beginning of this message that I stopped for three and a half weeks and went to Vail, Colorado. Good grief. You're like, oh, it's hard to be you, Pastor. I get it. It's it's a wonderful blessing that I got to experience there. And I stopped. And I didn't just stop. I stopped and I made space for God the Father to come in. And that's the second piece that I want to give to you today. So the mountains and the streams and the snow was all amazing when I was there. But that wasn't really the critical part. The critical part is that all the voices in my life went silent 
And in that quiet place, the still small voice of God started to get big. And it wasn't that he started speaking. It was that he had been speaking. And I couldn't hear. I got quiet space with my father in heaven, and he spoke things to me there that were healing and that were life-giving and things that he had been wanting to say for a very, very long time. Mom, what does God the Father want to speak to you? How does he want to heal your heart? How does he want to come to your soul? Because if he wants to come to your soul and if he's waiting and he's got a plan in order to restore you and bring you to a healthier place, both for you and his glory and your family, if he wants to do that work in you, you're going to have to stop. And you're going to have to listen. You're going to have to let him. Let me talk about this for just a second. I know, I know when I get to this second piece, the, the first piece is weirdly almost easier. It's the second piece that really messes with us to say, don't just stop, but stop and be before God in that holy place of your heart, however that looks. Doesn't matter the physical location. Doesn't even matter the day that it happens. But when you're before the Father yourself as his child, everything gets different, gets better, gets... But some of you... You've sought God that way before. So as we sit here and have this conversation, you're like, yep, I know what you're talking about. Yep, I've been there, and it was life-giving. I kind of forgot. I'm, I'm appreciating the reminder. I need to get back to that. But you've tasted the goodness of it, and you know you need to get back. Could I just acknowledge that? But some of you have never tasted it before. And so this is terrifying to you right? Because we all pray. Let's, let's just talk. We all pray constantly, especially when things are bad. We pray. But to pray and expect him to come to us, to expect him to talk back, to expect him to lead, to expect him to heal us, that's scary. It's scary because we're terrified he won't show up. Can we say it in church? We're terrified he won't show up. There's times that we've reached out to God and we didn't feel like we got anything back. We felt like it was all quiet. We felt like our prayers bounced off the ceiling and that fear, it haunts us. And I say it haunts us because we're here in church, man, and we're faith people and we never want to admit that kind of thing out loud, but we are afraid to pray. Because I've got this vulnerable faith. And what, what if God doesn't keep it up? And in the fear, we get paralyzed. And so we don't go. And as mothers, sometimes we can be so perfectionistic, just a few of you probably, we can get so perfectionistic that if I can't do it and have success with it, I'd rather not go. But right here is where it's all at. You and the Father. And I know that's hard to say, especially if, if you're in a space where it's like, I attend church and I'm faithful and I give and I do all of that. Here's the thing. It is you and Jesus. This is good. But this whole deal is you and Jesus. And your Father wants you to come to him. And you're going to see that today. You're going to see that in some of the other scripture that I've got to share with you. But you remember David in the Old Testament, Psalm 23, classic psalm. He says what? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, my shepherd, individual. Therefore, I lack nothing, he says. He says, my God, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Yes? Where's, where's the production in all that, Jesus? It's like, no just wanted my sheep to come right here and I've got plans for you and I'm going to stop you and I'm going to rest you and I'm going to restore you today. That that's what he wants for you. And then Jesus picks up that same thought in the New Testament in the Gospels. What does Jesus say? Jesus says he's the good shepherd. 
And he reinforces, David was right. You guys are the sheep and I'm the shepherd. I want you to be you. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. (sighs) He is not a demanding Jesus today, but he wants you to come to him. It's like, how, how, how could, it, how could your, your burden, your yoke be easy and light? How is that even possible? Because a lot of times I just feel like doing things for God or doing things with God is just one more extra thing in my life. And the, the, the thing is, when you start to walk with Jesus, he starts to reorient all of your priorities. And some of those things that you think are so essential and culture has told you are so essential or your mother-in-law has told you is so essential... Some of those things he takes off. And some of those things he puts them further down the list. And he comes in and he gives you a whole new yoke and a whole new burden. And as you walk with him, everything just gets better. There's a pastor and author named Lance Witt, and he said this. He said, ask any mom about her quiet time habits and successes, and she will laugh at you out loud. I loved that line. I had to read that. Why? Because so many moms, man, you are in it, especially if you've got young kids at home. You're in it. Got dumb pastor up here saying, have quiet time with God. What quiet time? What are you talking about? Where am I supposed to find that? 24-7 mom. I get it. I just want to say to you that I get it. But also... Just to challenge you that even if you can't come with the perfection, what can you come with? What can you, what can you bring to the Father as far as your time? I mean, some of you, some of you have got a spouse that would watch those kids for you and send you off to the Wichita Mountains for two hours with a Bible in your hand to go listen to the Father for a while. Can, can I tell you this? Husbands, to gift that to her is better than a day at the spa. Because it's her soul we're talking about. Give her the day at the spa too. (laughs) It's more of a both and thing. (laughs) Yes. But it's the soul. It's the soul that everything comes from, isn't it? For it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. What do our families need from our, our moms? A healthy soul. That's what we actually need. God sees your life and he knows. And are there certain days that you can get away? Are there certain just hours or or, or moments or nap times that you can get away? Are there bath times that someone else could step in and you could get away? You could just get to the next room with some silence just to, just to bring what you have to God. This, this is the kindness of God. If you, there's a spot in Revelation where Jesus is talking to a church and he says, you know what? You've already got too many burdens on you. I do not give you, I do not put on your shoulders any extra burden. He says that. And there's a spot where Jesus and the disciples in the gospel, they're sitting there in the temple. You might, might know this story. And they're watching people give into the offering plate. And all of a sudden, there's a widow that comes up, and she gives just, a, just pennies, puts it in there. And Jesus says, I know her life. I can see her life. And she just gave all she had. So what's the measurement that Jesus just did in his graces? He said, if you can't bring perfection, bring what you have. If you're like, I don't have hours of quiet time every week to give to the Father, what's the five minutes you have then? Because again, by holding yourself to this standard of religious perfection, you don't show up at all. And it's not that I want you to perform. That's, I'm nowhere near that. I just want you to show up and let the Father heal you. Because it's what he wants to do. He wants to speak to you. He has things for you. It's going to heal you in a way that you never thought was possible. So give him that, the widow's might. So the father is true rest. So let me give you how the father is true rest. Going to the father, time with the father, that is true rest. So here's the first reason why, because you cannot fix you. Soul work can't be done by you reading a self-help book, a blog. 
You need God the Father. He needs to x-ray your soul. He needs to deal with you. And it's so hard, I know, because we want to control it. We want to work so hard at it so that we're sure it'll happen. But there's a surrender as you stop. You stop and you trust. Because in the stopping is the trusting and the trusting is the healing. Look for the ancient ways. Look for the good way and walk in that. And you'll find healing and restoration for yourself. Because this is what God has been saying all along to his people. Find him that way. Your exhaustion, your fear, your mom guilt that is so real, the deep things that need to get fixed in your heart, trust the Father and let him fix you. Next, because his burden is kind and all the other burdens out there are not kind to you. The, the burden of this world is not kind. If you don't read this book at the proper time, you are probably scarring your child right now. And no matter how many books you've already read, there are other books out there that you haven't read yet, and so you're probably scarring your child right now. And if you're not reading these proper blogs and these proper YouTube channels, you are probably scarring your child right now. And by the way, your mom and your mother-in-law disagree with all the stuff that you've read, and they think that you're scarring your child right now. And if you don't get them into the right preschool, the exact right preschool in town, at the right time, you are scarring your child right now. And if you don't get them the right kind of theater coach to bring out their natural vocal ability so that they can be on Broadway someday, you are scarring your child right now. And it goes on and on and on. And we, we talk ourselves into things, do we not? And you go on vacation. You got to do the vacation. Right. You ever take your kids to Disney? Oh, my gosh. Take your kids to Disney. It's already expensive takes a lot of time. But when you go to Disney, you have to do Disney right. You have to read all the things in order to do Disney right. You know what I mean? And you got to get the fast pass and you got to, you got to research all the rides and you got to get into the right hotel that's in park, right? You get the little Mickey Mouse pancakes, you know, you got to, you got to do that or they're going to be scarred for life. Right? And you gotta, you got to know which parks you're going to go to in which sequence and which rides in those parks you're going to go to in which sequence. And you've got to get it all right. And what they say is to maximize the experience. I love that phrase, to maximize the experience. This is a phrase our culture uses to put perfectionism on you. Are you maximizing the experience of the third grade and then the fourth grade and then the fifth grade? It never stops. And Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary. Because <laughs> he's, got, he's got a kind burden for you. He doesn't have all that other burden. He doesn't have all those other people to please. He doesn't have all those other impossible standards for you to live up to. He wants you to be a mom, and he wants you to listen to him. His burden is kind. Next is he knows your true identity. We experience in this life this thing called identity creep. I call it identity creep. Where you start out with things and then you just keep adding things onto who I am, my identity, right? Like I'm Josh Trueblood and I'm an American and I'm a man and I'm a sci-fi nerd, right? And I'm a pastor and I'm an Oklahoman and all these things. And just you just start adding all these things that you are. And it's like this out of control Instagram bio, right? And it just kind of keeps growing. But what am I? See, God's got something to say about that. Who are you? There's this beautiful moment that happens in Jesus' life, and he gets baptized. Do you guys remember that? And John the Baptist baptizes him in the Jordan River, and it's this act of obedience that he does. And when he does, the Spirit descends on him like a dove, and the Father speaks from heaven. And what does the Father speak to him? This is my Son, whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Now think about Jesus for a second. Has he got titles? He's got lots of titles. Savior and Lord and healer and God and king and all these things. But when the father comes, he says, son, son. Do you realize that? This is my son who I love. And in him, I'm pleased. So we come and we say, I'm a mom. 
and you are. And it's an amazing calling. I'm about to get myself in some trouble right now. Because it is a life-changing, wonderful, beautiful, fulfilling calling. But it is not your first identity. You're a daughter of the Most High God. Amen. When you stand before the Father, that's what he's going to say to you. Because all those other ands and commas in your identity statement that you've got for yourself... You can fail in all of them. I get it. We all do. But he's giving you a core identity that's not up to you. You're just solid and secure in it. Amen. You get to be loved. And you get to know he's pleased through Jesus. He's pleased with you. And even when everybody else is mad, he's not. Do you see how he's trying to center your life? Do you see how he's trying to heal you? Do you see how he's got good things for you? And you're like, well, why? Why would he even love me like that? Why would he see daughter? Why? Because he finds you lovable. He looked out over all time and creation and he saw you and he found you lovable. And he chose you, the scripture says, chose you to love you. Does your love Moms and dads, does your love change for your kids based on their performance? Of course not. You just love them. You love them. In fact, God chose you that way. And so I want, I want you to help. I, I need you to stop. I need you to be in my presence. So that you would know that and be reminded of that. I can tell you day one in Colorado... As soon as I got quiet, first thing God said is, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am pleased. I don't need anything else. I stayed the other three weeks, but I didn't need anything else. <laughs> Last reason you can find him is your true rest. Because as families, we need your soul more than your task list. The enemy in this culture has got you so convinced that you can't stop because you have to get these other things done. And I'm just telling you, we need your soul. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Above all else, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. We need God shaping your soul, mom. Yes. It's worth it. Daughters of God, would you stand? We forget who we are. We get in the grind. We forget who we are. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, God, for these people that have gathered here today, Lord, and they are all your people, God, and you love them. And God, you see right through to their hearts. And God, for some, stopping is terrifying, and it will be an act of faith for them to attempt that. God, for some going into that holy place, that holy ground with you, Father, will be a difficult stretch. Lord, I ask for spiritual breakthrough, for the breaking of bonds. And I pray, Lord, that you would show up for these ladies, God. Remind them of who they are. And that, God, I pray the strength of their souls, God, would make an impact in their family. Christ's name.